Kia ora. Welcome, everybody. It's uh, my pleasure this morning to chair the data and instrumentation session. My name's Alex Trawards. I am a senior principal research scientist and program leader at the Australian Antarctic Division. I've been working in the, the sub-Antarctic, the Southern Ocean and Antarctic in my whole working life. It's, it's a place, it's a, they're places that are really special to me and I'm very passionate about trying to improve environmental outcomes and I guess do what we can to translate our, the great science that we do into, into good decision making and, and improving policy. I've worked across a, a range of species and biomes. I guess I'm a quantitative ecologist when, it all, when it's all said and done, and I can turn my hand to, to most species. And, um, but these days I manage a, a program at the Australian Antarctic Division called the Integrated Digital East Antarctica Program. And, and I'm really interested in, in forming collaborations around the use of large and complex data sets, bringing those data sets together across disciplines, and really starting to think about some of the, the hard scientific questions in Antarctica and the Southern Ocean and the sub-Antarctic that, that have been facing us for some time that we've had difficulty answering. And I think today we'll hear uh, from, a, from some great presenters around a whole range of areas, whether that be uh, relating to, to technology or, or data or, or, or innovation, that's really going to help us to, to, I guess, progress that science. And I think that's probably enough of an introduction. I think uh, I'd really like to, to start the session. The first speaker that we have today is Dr Simon Cox. He's a principal scientist at GNS Science. He's got expertise in geological mapping, structural geology, tectonics and fluid flow. His research has played a, a transformative role in advancing geological knowledge in the South Island and also in Antarctica. Today he'll be talking about the Antarctic Geologic, Geological Mapping Project that he's been leading. This is one of the most impressive collaborative projects to pull together a data set that, that I've seen in a long time and uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing from Simon today. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa. Um, hopefully, Already you have been bombarded by this um, set of images that our comms team have put together and which have been rolling around on the screen at the moment, um, which really sort of sets the scene for this continental geological data set that we've put together. Um, and this has been, a, a, I guess, a, a seven-year odyssey of gathering people together and my job today really is to try and give you a bit more depth into the why you are seeing that going and what it really means and um, kind of explain that process. Um, but ultimately we have got now a geological data set of the continent which represents all of the um, exposed areas of rock. It's scientifically conservative in that it's not meant to be an interpretation under the ice or anything like that. It's the, it's the basis from which you would do that, but it's representing, like a, a, a geological fact map that the miners often use, uh, it's representing what's poking out in terms of the bedrock and the, and the cover sequences. And it's now all in a, in a very modern GIS data set. Um, how did we get to doing this and why did we do this? Well, it really kind of started back about the time of the roadmap development and the scientific roadmap, and they were asking all the scientific questions. And if you look at that roadmap and go back to it, what you'll find is the majority of them are cross-disciplinary. There are very few that sit in their own disciplines anymore. And so when people were saying what's happening in Antarctica, they wanted to know about questions like here, on the right hand side is one of the most amazing things where bits of quartz rock scattered around in northern Victoria land, the white quartz rock, if you picked it up, have mosses underneath them, but any of the other rocks don't. That the substrate there was making a difference in terms of the amount of light and the amount of energy and the amount of water and things like that. And if you look on the left hand side, there's an example there just of the way in which the Ice is melting in association with albedo of the rock and the rock is shedding material off and weathering and giving a different grain size which, which either holds the water or doesn't hold the water depending on what the, 
rock type is and how it's shedded depending on the original grain size. So those sorts of questions are really important and we realised that geology was basically getting to the point where it was becoming irrelevant. So we had 100 years worth of geological research. We had, in fact, we found later on about 993 different names that people were calling the rocks and 589 maps and it's, it's just a nightmare. For anyone wanting to try and use that information, we had to essentially save it. So then it became a case of organising that data and, and structuring it, and the problem was to get a united classification that could be used in all sorts of different ways, and that was the hard part because we weren't experts in all different areas. To make that in a sort of simplistic way and describe what that is, it's, it's, it's like this kids sorting uh, thing where we have rocks all over Antarctica and we're trying to sort them into different ways, into maybe trains or fire trucks or buses or whatever, um, and, and finding different ways of sorting and classifying. And essentially, you can do that in lots of different ways. So in, in this example there, we're sorting by colour in one dimension and we're sorting by type in another. And if you go into the geological data set, that's exactly what's happened, is, is we've got this legend and a whole classification which is essentially sorting by rock type or by age. So it, what we call a chronolithostratigraphic subdivision in geology. And, and, and you've got uh, you know, different rock types across the top, so um, sedimentary, metamorphic and igneous, and then you can drive down into, into that into more detail as to whether it's an, a... Um, you know, granites and granodiorites and, and so forth across in one direction and age in the other. And it's not a new thing, we, we're copying essentially um, classification that came from the Australian geological map and we uh, are using essentially and delivering it into the one geology of the world. So that then enables you to then go and pull it apart and ask and look at it in different ways. Essentially, it's kind of like having, rather than just two dimensions of classification, because we've got so many different fields, each polygon, and there's 99,000 of them, or 99,080, um, each one has 42 different attributes. So it's kind of like a 42-dimensional classification scheme, which is rather kind of full on, but you can simplify it right down into either a lithostratigraphic classification, a chronostratigraphic one, or into a simplistic geology which looks at the history. So there's lots of ways that we tried to provide it in a way that you can then use and question it. What does that mean? How do we apply it? How do we use it? Well, if you zoomed in, perhaps one of the best examples would be at the edge of the dry valleys, looking from the Ross Sea up into the, into the top of the Victoria Valley here, and the age is so different in those sufficial deposits. It, it, millions of years, two million, three million years old up in the, up in the Victoria Valley and down on the coast 26,000 years or less uh, with the, the re-entrant ice coming in off the ice shelf. Huge differences in age. So if you're trying to look at the evolution or the, the, the genetic diversification of the active layer within the sediment, it's so, it could potentially be so, so different. You've also got differences in the way it weathers and the roughness and major differences in permeability and porosity depending on how those sediments have formed. Um, and we're certainly interested, I can see it being applied into groundwater work. Um, if you step back and look at the whole continent, you can take that data set, you can knock it down into, into say for example here, just centroids of the polygons, and you can plot up, for example, on the uh, left hand side, a map showing you the the distribution of local glacial tills versus ice sheet related tills. So essentially it's where is the record of large changes in ice flow patterns, which are major climatic events presumably, versus what is local precipitation variation and local changes that are occurring on smaller glaciers. On the right, you've got a distribution of meltwater ponds, and you can look at the correlation of those, and in this case, I've coloured it according to growing degree days from the MODIS satellite. And you can look at, you know, why might we be having meltwater in different areas, how much of that is related to the albedo of the geology. 
Alex has uh, been involved in this bioregionalisation work and classification of Antarctica, and I can foresee that if you then go into those different zones, you'll be able to pull them apart in terms of geology. And an example of doing that would be to make substrate chemistry maps just purely from the geological polygon. So here I've done phosphorus and iron, it took about 10 minutes, it's not that good, but it gives you an idea of how it might be applied to tell you something about the resources that are available for life and for where hotspots of life might develop. It's been a big road. We started essentially forming an action group with SCAR. We got collaboration from all around the world, largely from the scientists who we needed to contact to explain the work that they had done so that we could translate it. And then they ended up inevitably, a lot of them were the older geologists, they weren't very involved with sort of GIS or any sort of computer work for, for geology. So then we tapped into their students and we had a lot of them come to Dunedin um, and worked pretty much in return for borrowing my surfboard or my bicycle or borrowing my car or our, or our batch and they would come for six weeks and have a holiday in New Zealand and during the week I would crack the whip and, and uh, make them digitise. And right in the centre of that was Belinda Smith Little who is responsible for all the architecture of that 42 dimensional kind of beast and and, and and knocking it into shape and so it's been just an incredible journey of all these people and the credits would roll if we had a movie going and and you can you can't read it but that's deliberate there's so many people have been involved in it it's also quite interesting that we can potentially start to learn from it from a scientific perspective. And I just want to finish on, a, on something partly because Stephen was talking about it yesterday in his talk. And this is around social media and the delivery of things. Geomap is kind of underpinning science and it's really hard in New Zealand's framework that Peter Gluckman has been pushing for us to be delivering stuff and having the impact and d demonstrating the impact. And one of the best ways to do that is to look at at who's citing it and, and so forth. And I've been absolutely privileged by our, having our comms team who've taken this on and, and developed these banners and, and had a go at it. Um, I'm, I'm of the generation where I wasn't allowed on Facebook because my kids were, and so I never really kind of did the social media thing, but then eventually I sort of slipped into using Instagram as a way of just keeping my photos. And we published this paper in Scientific Data. We put the archive on um, Pangaea, and now we've been kind of watching what's been happening. So this is a graph of the hits and the visits to a website that we built with, uh, called, it, it's, it's the, about the documents. It's the, it's the most detailed stuff that you would need to do to understand Geomap. So, while other people are sitting there getting the tweets and, and, and scrolling through the things, anyone that's really interested in it will go to this site. And in this site, um, we have got all the documentation that you would need and some incredible data that's been scraped. And you can see all these spikes. And I was really interested, what, what's causing all of these different things? And how does the publication in Nature Scientific Data, where does it sit? Well. If you track these, since it's pretty much since the time that we put the archive on Pangaea, the the spike, the the first sort of major one, there's a, the, there's a sort of the web maps were updated. We've got 29 different co-authors, so we get a spike from them all sort of getting it and looking at it and things early on. But when we published in Scientific Data, we didn't get a very good spike at all, and that was kind of interesting. And then GNS put out a whole lot of stuff on, on uh, Twitter, and then it went to SCAR's Twitter site, and that gives, gives you the, a fairly large spike in the middle. But the largest spike was I published a blog on the Nature Portfolio um, blog site, and that drove, obviously, a lot of people in to kind of have a look at it. And I find that absolutely fascinating. And what it sort of says to me is that scientists don't read papers anymore. That we get our feed and our information from blogs 
or at least in the first instance we do. And it says to me that if you're trying to publish a scientific paper, you have to do this. There's no choice, you have to do that. And we can have another little fun with this because if you want to, the New Zealand uptake, New Zealand-Australian uptake of this paper, it hasn't been great um, in comparison with overseas. So if you want to go and, and create a new spike in a non-linear kind of feedback thing here, have a go at that um, QR code or, or just, just see if we can get a, a New Zealand hit kind of thing this week that actually gives Sam a chance as a computer geek to go, whoa, what's happening in New Zealand? It's kind of fun. So it's, to me it's fascinating and I'm in the latter part of my career and I see this whole thing in science that's evolving that's really weird and something that we have to embrace because we've got these messages coming out now on Radio New Zealand and things and the one from the other day, you know, absolutely outstanding what's going on in, um, in Europe and we're not getting it across. You know, we're still, we're sitting there worried about potholes on the roads and the roads will be gone soon. And we need to understand what the public's doing with social media and how you're going in there with, with the, the actual, you know, fact type things versus fake information. And, and, and where, where we place our science in that, in that space. And how we, we place publication in that space and then play this game as well. I find it kind of frightening, but it's also interesting. And for no other reason is that, you know, we've got El Nino coming on and quite frankly, we had enough of passive smoking downstream from the Australian bushfires a few years ago and we don't really want that to happen again for you guys or we don't want it to happen for us either. So um, the time is nigh to, uh, yeah, get going on, on, on this stuff again and understanding how people are taking those messages up. My underpinning, underpinning science is only a, a little part of that game, um, but it's very clearly important. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much, Simon. Uh, do we have any questions for Simon? Up the back on the right. Hi, that was a really great talk, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, because I'm not a geologist and I have no idea how these maps are actually made, what kind of observations go into behind the maps? So is it all just on the ground, people looking at rocks, or is there any remote sensing technology that you know helps collate a continental scale map? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, initially, there are mainly people on the ground looking, because some of these ones, the earliest map we've got is 1907 for ours map. So they're sort of colouring in, oh, that mountain over there is granite. What we wanted to be able to do is capture the fact that the satellites now go around the poles, and Antarctica is one of the most photographed places because of the way that the satellites go. And so there's sub-metre scale hyperspectral imagery that you can build geological maps from. But you have to know what it is that you're looking at in order to classify that data to then turn it into a digital map. And so part of the mandate for doing this was to do exactly that, is that we can now take this and classify the high resolution data and we can put time series changes, for example, with snow going backwards and forwards, so we can actually see how the snow and the albedo of the geology is causing changes in the snow. So it's, it's really exciting now that we've actually got a full coverage of the con continent. Great. Well, we're going to wrap this talk up now. Thanks again, Simon. And uh, next up we have Dr. Johan Bartelomey. <laughs>